Dear RIA members and most welcome guests, welcome to RIA webinar on rare earth elements in a sustainable circular economy. My name is uh, Giovanni Curci, I'm an associate analyst at Talaxis, a subsidiary of uh, the Noble Group and uh, vice president of RIA board of directors. Uh, as I'm sure uh, you're, already, uh, uh, you're already aware, RIA is the Global Rare Earth Association and our aim is to facilitate cooperation with the, within the rare earth industry to improve its transparency and sustainability. Today's webinar links with the EIT Raw Material Summit and the launch of the European Raw Material Alliance. Hence, we will be focusing on the sustainability of rare earth exploration and production and on the development of projects and processes to move toward a circular economy. Our members will share their real life experience in achieving these goals. During each presentation, we will be collecting questions from the audience in the Q&A section on the right hand side of your monitor, which we will then ask to the presenter at the end of the presentation. Alternatively, you can also use the raise your hand button always on the right hand side or hand side of your monitor. I'm also very excited uh, to share with all the attendees that today's session is fully booked, which is very flattering and very encouraging at the same time, as it demonstrates that more and more people are, turn are turning their attention toward a sustainable rare earth industry and that our work is being uh, recognized across many geographies. Uh, I have here uh, also with me uh, Nabil Manciri, uh, who is the uh, uh, responsible for uh, RIA administration and uh, uh, management. He is the Secretariat uh, of RIA. Without further ado, let's start today's session uh, with our first presentation. We have with us uh, John Scott Nielsen from Greenland Minerals. Greenland Minerals uh, is a member of uh, RIA. And uh, John will talk to us uh, today about uh, sustainable mining in Greenland. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, chance to present um, uh, sustainable mining in Greenland and specifically the Cranefield project, uh, which is a project that contains a number of uh, commodities that we actually will help make the uh, create a greener world because the central um, part the central part of our deposit and the central park commercial part of our deposit is actually rare earth metals here's an important notice that stand out for any presentation um, and uh, i'll just skip it uh, to the next one a very short corporate snapshot uh, of uh, greener minerals we hold a license in Greenland, an exclusive license, um, and the owner of that license is Greenland Minerals AS, which is a company registered in Greenland. It is a requirement by the Mineral Resources Act of Greenland that anyone who obtains a license for exploitation needs to be a company registered in, 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 in Greenland. Uh, our parent company, Greenland Minerals Limited, is listed on the ASX in Australia. You can actually see on the screen uh, a distribution of our investors. And as you can see, we have an international shareholder base. The largest amount of our shareholders actually come from Australia. Uh, and also United States carry a very large share of our shareholder owners with a uh, among European shareholders. The same share on, on, on um, uh, we have a very diversified uh, shareholder base. Our project is situated in the southwest part uh, of Greenland, uh, and uh, you can see it uh, with the uh, yellow um, angle around the southern part of Greenland, and you can see it on the large. Uh, map where it's uh, where we had the red um, indication of where Cranefield is situated. It's a, an area that is very accessible. It's open year-round. There's never any times during the year where it's closed by ice and so on. 
So it's logistically a very, very good place to be, close to harbor, as close to an international airport, a mild climate, and so on. And this is uh, another slide uh, that actually shows uh, the extent of our exclusive license. You can see it on the map on the slide. Uh, we actually have three deposits uh, that contains a jog resource of more than one, one billion tons of, of, of uh, deposits. And uh, you can see we call them the Cranifield, that's the one that we have uh, explored mostly, but you can also see the two others, they are called Zone 3 and the other one called Sorensen. The resource contains more than 11 million tons of rare earth, uh, 2.4 million tons of zinc, and also 0.27 million tons of uranium. Uh, we think it's one of the largest global uh, resources that have a compliant JOC code, actually. Phase one of our project um, covers the first uh, 37 years, and that is based on uh, exploiting 108 million tons of uh, ore, and those are that is an, an ore reserve, in also um, confirmed by the JOC standard. So, what are we going to do? Well. Uh, the initial development scenario has been rigorously investigated with feasibility studies, EIA and SIA studies. I'll come back to where we are in that permitting uh, process a little later. We intend to start out with processing 3 million tons of ore per year uh, for the first 37 uh, years of, of, of the mine life. And the annual production that is in our plan is more than 30,000 tons of uh, rare earth products per year, 15,000 tons of zinc, and 8,700 tons of fluid spar and 500 tons of uranium. After 37 years, only 10% of the defined resources have actually been extracted, so there is actually clear scope to expand production, but also to increase mine life. Going to the next uh, uh, screen here, um, actually four of the rare earth uh, metals are uh, the, the four web that we and, and everyone calls rare earth magnet metals. And they are actually in the center of our feasibility study and in our financial model. And that is neodymium, proseodymium, terbium, and dysprosium. And uh, our yearly production plan to start out with is that we intend to produce around 6,000 tons of these four critical magnet rare earth. We do believe uh, there's a little bit of different sources, but we believe that that would actually cover in round figures around. 15% of uh, the present world demand for, for rare earth magnet metals. Um, and we do believe that uh, also from, from come back to that, but they are very important to the different policies in different parts of the world in terms of the electrification of the transport system, you know, about developing wind turbines, electric vehicles, and also a lot of the other areas within consumer electronics, uh, consumer appliances, and so on. Uh, I had the pleasure uh, yesterday of actually, uh, or was it the day before, I can remember, of visioning uh, the, the presentation of the EU uh, uh, Alliance on, on Raw Materials. And that is, as we see it, part of the action plan for critical materials from the EU. And uh, we think that is a really good idea that they are now establishing the European Raw Materials Alliance. We also think that it's very, very uh, fruitful to bring all together all relevant stakeholders and uh, also to try and increase the EU resilience in the rare earth and magnet value change. Um, we, we, we have noted that, that the EU Commission uh, foresees that by 2050 and even earlier that there will be a very large demand for rare earth magnets within critical products uh, within the sector, as I mentioned before, wind generators, electrical vehicles, industrial pumps, and so on, that could actually increase, uh, that demand could increase uh, very dramatically in the years to come. Also, the Commission uh, stated uh, their launch meeting that today they see uh, it as a challenge that China provides more than 90% of the supply of, of rare earth. The next one, um, how does that feel into the different supply constraints in Europe uh, screen industrial sectors? Well, uh, we, there are a lot of specialists out there coming with forecasts right now, but, but some of them forecasted with that once, once we come out of 2020, uh, we will see a, a, a rise in the, in the economy again. And, 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 and one of the forecasts you see is that 
we will see a rise of almost 10% a year from, from 2020 to 2030. And that will also correspond to a similar growth within the magnet metals such as neodymium, quasiodymium, dysprosium, and terbium. We also see from the different uh, forecasts and also our internal analysis that the present production capacity will not be able to meet the growing demand. And uh, unless uh, new sources of supply comes up also to, to, to close the gap in Europe, we will see a supply shortage for industrial sectors, again, within the sectors I, I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier, electric vehicles, wind turbine, pump industry, consumer electronics and, and appliances and so on. That would leave, in our opinion, serious challenges to, to European industry groups within the above mentioned sectors. But it would also, you know, uh, unless you can fill that gap, seriously challenge the Commission's plan to increase the target for CO2 uh, emission reductions uh, going on to 2030. Just a few things that, that are vital to, to, to the constraints of the European market. There's a lot of numbers out there, but if we look into the Paris Agreement um, and, and the, the, the international agreement that we have to bring down greenhouse gases, well, some of the numbers say that we need to have at least 100 million cars on the road by 2030. I actually noticed that the EU Commission actually was now talking about a figure that was much higher than that. We also see the global wind turbine market expanding rapidly these years. Uh, we also see a design that is into to, to fourth generation with, with, with hopefully use uh, an increased use of permanent magnets. We also see the pump market. I noticed that one of the large companies of Denmark, Confos, was part of the launch meeting from the EU and, and, and uh, also noted uh, their focus on making sure that we can actually secure the supply of, of these central critical minerals to, to the EU market. And also, again, the home appliance industry and the consumer electronics sector are growing rapidly these years and will also contribute to the, to the need for more supply sources. So this is where we are with our project right now. We think we're in a good position actually to be part of those that could fill uh, the European gap for and, and the need for permanent magnets actually for generations to come. We have worked intensely with our cooperative partners. We have been able to, to, to work uh, intensively on slimming the, the cost structure. We are now in a position where the capital costs have reduced, been reduced to 505 US, uh, million US dollars. And uh, as I said before, uh, the, the production plan is now more than 30,000 tons of rare earth and inclusive of the 6,000 tons of neodymium, pasiodymium, terbium, and dysprosium. Uh, we have a very uh, detailed flow sheet. We have the technology due to our close cooperative partners, and we also have low operating costs. And where are we in the permitting status right now? Well, some of you might have noticed that we uh, sent out a message to the ASX uh, uh, earlier this week, where we uh, were happy to inform that now we have uh, had all the application documents approved for going into public hearing. You basically have to have two uh, assessment documents, or actually there's three, but the two main ones are a social impact assessment that was already accepted for public consultation in, in 2019. And now the environmental impact assessment has just here in September uh, been approved also for being um, uh, completed uh, so that it can go into public hearing. Um, we need to go into public hearing. Every mine project has to do that. And uh, where we are right now is that we will have to uh, translate it into uh, final, finalize the translation, I should say, into to, to Greenlandic. We are going to put it out uh, for public hearing in three languages, English, Danish, and Greenlandic. But all those translations are, are working well, and we expect to be able to hand them over in all three languages by, before the end of this month. And uh, then these assessment documents will have to be presented on the Greenland government's web page hearing portal in order to conduct a public hearing. It's a requirement by law in Greenland that these kind of large uh, mineral resource projects have to go through a public hearing um, period of at least eight weeks. And um, when once that uh, public hearing period has public hearing period has been finalized, we as a company have to prepare a white book where we comment on all the received hearing answers. 
we will have to send in that white book to the Ministry of Mineral Resources. And then the next phase will actually be uh, for them to present uh, the application to the government of Greenland in order for them to process the application for an exploitation license. So I can simply say that we, are, we have moved uh, very, very far ahead and, 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 and it's a very large step for us that we have now been able to move into this final stages of, of the permitting process. Um, so we also feel that our business development plans are very much in line with the EU raw material strategy. I think we Greenland as a general uh, rule of thumb has the potential regarding a lot of the elements on the EU critical lists and but not least the various metals. We have a, in our business plan look into how can we link the geological potential of Greenland with the market needs of, of for instance Europe and uh, we have looked for partners uh, to, to, to get the best cooperative partners in terms of optimizing the, the rare earth value change and also the rare earth separation. And we have looked into different uh, possible cooperative partners. And that, act, that process actually led to the recognition that the Chinese uh, rare earth company, Shenghe, was a very good fit. Uh, they, they are a company that is focused on international supply. They have a very high technical uh, knowledge and competence. And they are also a public listed company, and uh, and also I think this the the the, the very special role and the knowledge is also exemplified by the fact that they are also also part of the the reopening of the mountain pass rather project in in the United States. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, Shenghi owns ten percent of our company, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, and as you also can see here on the slide, most of our uh, shareholder base actually comes from 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 the United States, from from Australia, and and from Europe, and 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 that is actually uh, the way we want it uh, to develop. But Shenghi has played a very very important role in in, in actually uh, increasing our uh, level of technology knowledge and also our cost efficiency and cost by forty percent. In, in, in Denmark and, and, and other places in December 19, they actually participated in a large conference held in by the Danish Federation of Danish, Danish Industry uh, Confederation uh, of, of that type. And they were quite open that they support, the, which is to export to minerals and also that taking place in, in, in China. Now, uh, well, the next step is to, to uh, uh, an agreement, hopefully with the European industry. Uh, yes. To, to, to go into our and the opportunities for the European Alliance on rare earth and linking downstream players with the part of the industry. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, that was uh, like a very uh, useful uh, insight from, uh, from the project. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Okay. So let's see now whether we have questions from uh, the audience. Yes, hi, yeah. this is uh, Kirill Mogerman from Geomega. Yes. Yeah, hi, Kevin. Jorn, you mentioned in one of the slides that the metallurgy or the process seems to be uh, uh, very simple. Uh, I mean, I don't uh, remember. I remember back in the days it was a fairly complex process considering the zinc and the uranium. Uh, and you're stating uh, that it's been improved and it's very simple now. 
could you please provide any more information in terms of uh, what process is being used and uh, and well, uh, uh, and is it going all the way down to separated oxides or uh, concentrates? Yeah. So well, I, I, maybe I should say that that obviously everything is relative. It's not simple to separate rare earth, but but we have got access to a partner who who is who has a very who has helped us a lot in simplifying the process that we have had initially uh, foreseen. And, and, and the idea is actually uh, to have the final separation of, 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 of a lot of the rare earth concentrate taking place in Europe. And, and that's the final concentrate into to the quality and the grade that the partners, offtake partners would prefer. So that is, that is one of the things that we need to talk with uh, partners about. But, but the idea is to have the final separation done in Europe in close uh, contact with, with offtake partners. Uh, the idea is to, to, to export the concentrate from Greenland uh, and have it uh, uh, separated in, in Europe, as I said. So that's, that's what I can say about it now. But the, the good thing is, and when we talk about being more simple, uh, it's true, it's not simple, but, but the cooperation with Shenghe has actually meant that we have been able to simplify uh, the process a lot uh, compared to what we had anticipated before we entered into that cooperation. And the mineralization is found in uh, are those basnesite monazites or uh, what kind of mineralization? Well, it's it's a, it's a mineral called uh, stenstropine uh, that it sits in uh, and uh, sits in a, that is part of a, another mineral called luleobrite. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, yeah. please? Yes, Luc Pes from Rare Earth Advisory. Um, I would uh, rebound maybe on a key question. Uh, why uh, don't you consider processing, separating uh, the concentrate uh, in Greenland uh, itself? Uh, yeah. Why would it not be, you know, more, let's say, rational from a life cycle analysis, especially as I suppose a part of your concentrate will be shipped to China, to Chengde, to be processed hmm. there? Well, okay. yes, it's a very, very good question. Um, can you hear me fine? Yes, I do. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Uh, well, we will do some of the processing in Greenland. We will, we will separate out uh, zinc. We will separate out um, uranium oxide, and and we will, we will uh, separate uh, the, the the fluor spot, and we will also uh, then separate uh, the rare earth into a, a concentrate. We have. Also been considering uh, to separate cerium and lanthanum out in, in in Greenland and then take the rest of the concentrate to Europe. The reason why we feel that it's best to take the final part of that uh, processing in Europe is is for two main reasons. One is it's as close to to those we feel should be our corporate corporate partners, uh, but also. Greenland is, is, even though it's a very large country, we also have a small population. We, we, we are only 56,000 people altogether. So we also have a limited workforce and especially, you know, a limited workforce within those kind of competences that would be needed to do that final uh, separation. And we, we feel that it's probably more realistic to, to have and attract those kind of competences in a, in a, in a European ju jurisdiction rather other than in Greenland, even though I should say it's wonderful to live in Greenland, it's a, it's a little bit far away from, from, from the rest of the world. I hope that answers your question, but, but, but those are the, the, the reasons why we are, we are aiming at this business plan. Yeah, fair point. Uh, so if I may add a, a follow-up, does that mean that you are seeking uh, partners to process the ore uh, in uh, Europe itself? Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. Uh, so that is going to be part of the the, the, the ongoing process. Uh, of course, we have you know worked on an internal marketing uh, plan, and uh, we have outlined a lot of potential cooperative partners that we, that we want to talk to, uh, and and both within offtake partners, but also within producers, uh, but also within uh, what you might call the chemical industry, the separation industry. Um, I cannot say a lot about that right now, but but the no, idea sure. is that we would like to have a partner in, in in that field as well. That's right. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, I also received a couple of questions in the panel, John. Uh, one is when would the the consultation process start for the for the license? Do you have a time frame for that? Well, um, let me start from the end of the time frame. Uh, we 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 hope that it's realistic that we can get an exploitation license in in, in 21 uh, and hopefully in the first half of 21, because we are now so advanced in in in, in the processing of that. So uh, then we have to to uh, finalize uh, talks, final talks with with investors, financing groups, and so on. That will, that will, that will take uh, some time, and then we will have a two-year construction period, and that's when we are ready to 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 uh, to actually start producing. So I'm not setting an exact date, I know, but I'm giving you an indication that that we we hope to be effective. Uh, within the next three years, maybe four, but that that's that's the that's the overall time frame that we are that we are hoping for. Yep, and perhaps a bit of controversial or or not so clear question that somebody was asking: Isn't it illegal to export the technology uh, from China, the processing technology from China to Europe, if you want to process the material in Europe? Will Chenge do that? Well, I, I can say that we will abide by any laws and regulations uh, that, that you can be assured of. Uh, we, we have no intention of, of of doing that, and I don't think saying he has to do that either. So everything will be done in accordance with uh, with all rules and regulations. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And any further questions from the from the audience? Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm Sander van Nielen from uh, Leiden University, um, and I wonder, well, the, the prices of rare earths can be quite volatile, um, so what, what price level would you need to um, have a profitable mining operation? Well, um, let me answer it this way, um, as you saw from my presentation. Between 80 and 90 percent of our revenue in our feasibility study is estimated to come from the four various uh, magnet metals: neodymium, dysprosium, protium, and terbium. And um, I think that from most forecasts, what we see there is that you need these uh, metals in in a, in a growing rate. Most of the forecasts you see right now actually foresee that the demand will grow much faster than what the present production capacity can actually deliver to the market. And, and the reason that's also what I try to highlight a little bit in my presentation is that the transition of, for instance, all uh, cars and vehicles in the world from, you know, gasoline cars, diesel cars into electric cars, they will need, uh, at least with the present technology, motors based on uh, permanent magnets. I mean, more than 90% of electric vehicles now use permanent magnets. Uh, so, and also you see other technologies as are highlighted within wind turbine, the pump industry and so on, and consumer electronics and so on. So our belief is that we will see, and that's what most forecasts actually foresee, these are these four metals that are in a corner of our feasibility study, or in the center of our feasibility studies, are the ones that are probably least vulnerable to the general economic uh, development uh, on a world scale, because you need them for the green transition. You need them to, to turn the world into a more su sustainable economy. So, so even regardless of whether we have, you know, a growth or, or a large growth or a small growth on in, in the international economy, most, most experts foresee that both, both the demand and the prices over the next 10 years for, for these magnet metals will actually rise substantial. And that is also our expectation, and and and, uh, and 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 our and I can also say that that our feasibility study and our fi financial model is very comfortable. We we have worked a lot. We are we we are working with a very low uh, cost structure in terms of what we can foresee uh, as market price in the years to come. I won't come with any definitive prognosis on the prices. There's a lot of experts out there selling a report on on exactly that topic. 
If I can ask a question, uh, sorry, Ian Gandal, Australian Strategic Materials. Yeah. You're, looking to sell a, you're looking to sell a concentrate. What sort of discount do you think you're going to have to bear, given that you're selling a concentrate as opposed to separated rare earths? Well, we don't necessarily intend to sell a concentrate. We, 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 we intend to have a partner in, in separating those and then sell the individual rare earths. That, that's the plan. Uh, the next presentation will be from uh, Leonard and Sort. Uh, I hope I, I pronounced it uh, correctly. Uh, from uh, Ron, uh, Rocklink. Uh, Rocklink is as well a, a member of RIA and is involved in the uh, recycling of uh, rare earth. In fact, uh, today Leonard will, will be talking uh, to us about uh, scrap collection and uh, separation. My name is Leonard Ansorge and I will uh, talk a bit about the uh, current state of the magnet recycling industry right now and about the uh, various approaches that we already implemented and uh, tend to implement uh, for the collection and separation of magnets and magnet assemblies. Um, first of all, i just give a brief introduction into um, what Rockling actually does, what our business units are and the solutions that we're currently providing, um, followed by the um, state of the magnet recycling industry and the uh, material streams that are available in the market at this point, um, and then give an idea about um, the innovations on collection and separation that uh, that that we use as approaches and that uh, the market uh, on a micro and, and macro level uh, could implement to increase the recycling efficiency and subsequent volumes uh, for collection and um, at the end i will talk a bit about the uh, what we see as the current developments in the magnet recycling um, industry right now and the future trends that will um, shape the industry in the next couple of years. So um, Rocklink belongs to a um, recycling group called Petromine that is uh, focused on the recycling of non-ferrous uh, metals such as rare, rare earth, cobalt, nickel, um, but also copper and, and, and vanadium, for example, and various operations in, in, in Asia and in Germany and uh, specifically for the uh, rare earth and magnet scraps, we also signed an offtake agreement with um, the Canadian recycler AJ Omega that is currently building up the facility in, in Quebec, Canada. And um, our approaches for our relatively niche, uh, niche, niche market scrap materials is always to have a fully integrated value chain that covers the waste collection at the, uh, at the point of generation to the raw material supply to the consumer. Um, yeah, so um, Petromine is the holding entity and we recently have um, subdivided our operations in two divisions, which is the rare, uh, rare metals recycling division as well as the product division that we call fine chemicals and metals. Um, so the, the, the rare earth metals um, division is then subdivided in various fields. Historically, the operations were focused on span catalysts and industrial slurries. That's why the name Petromine also comes from. Um, but since around 15 years, uh, magnets are a topic as well, mainly from streams uh, from, from Asia, so Japan, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia. And since around seven years, also from, from Europe. The lithium ion batteries. Uh, something that we focus on since around three or four years and seen an, an incredible increase in, in, in materials available for recycling mainly from from production scrap the fine chemicals and metals division is focused on bringing certified recycled materials back into the market in a, in a in closed loop arrangements and um, there the focus is on magnet and catalyst rare earth, as well as on uh, battery raw materials. So uh, our strategic orientation is um, it's more and more focusing on the electric vehicle drivetrain um, and the critical raw materials that it contains. Um, 
and our ideas are more and more focusing on bringing the most significant uh, material streams from the EV drivetrain together in one consolidated recycling center and uh, having scale effects on separation, collection and, uh, and, and downstream recycling in, in these locations. So the current state of maximum recycling, so it, as for the majority of, of available recycling streams, also the rare earth material streams uh, are usually classified in, in, with five factors, which is the accessibility, covering the sources where the materials come from, pre-consumer, post-consumer, the locations um, where, it, where it occurs, and the, and the frequency or the availability of the materials. Um, especially for small volume materials, such as magnet scrap, Legal restrictions um, are a, an, an important aspect since we need to gather volumes from all around the world to, ha to have enough material in hand to, uh, to actually enable a, a, a large scale recycling that is uh, cost efficient and, and, and uh, generates a significant uh, amount of raw materials. So transboundary waste shipments, waste classifications and dangerous, good, dangerous goods classifications play more and more important role in that whole um, operation. In most cases, the magnets do not occur as, as, uh, as pure materials, but rather in assemblies. And uh, the assembly complexity plays a role in deciding what are the handling and separation costs of an, of an, of an assembly. And that varies a lot depending on the size and the, um, and the complexity. Whereas concentration is something that drives the value of the magnet scrap and we're seeing more and more three types of different general categories that we subdivide magnet scrap or neodymium iron boron scrap, um, which is um, old magnet scrap, old center magnet scrap um, that is more than 10 years old, which still contains relatively high amounts of dy and tb. Um, then recent, through the recent innovations such as grain boundary diffusion or um, and the net shape production, seeing less and less waste occurring in production, as well as um, reduced dy and tb content, which is good for the consumer, but not so good for the for the recycling industry, as um, the general value of that material stream is getting lower. And uh, the lowest um, and more co complex um, materials that we see in the market is more and more the hybrid materials, such as plastic bonded, rubber or epoxy bonded magnets, that um, that have a lot of benefits in production, but um, have also the highest complexity in recycling. The volumes available play a significant role in, in, in deciding what solutions should be provided for collection and disassembly. So generally speaking, the larger, larger and more homogeneous the volume is, uh, the better and better it is to, uh, to establish a fully or semi-automatic disassembly line and also streamline collection in a more um, efficient manner. So I've picked um, four, four types of uh, recyclable material streams that we would consider as currently the most significant one, just to showcase a bit uh, what we're right now facing in the market and uh, where the challenges occur in, in, in collection and separation. So the most significant source of, um, that is available for recycling is the processing waste from magnet manufacturing, which is which can occur in swarf and slag, as well as in powder, oxidized powder, which is usually classified as um, as dangerous since it's self-flammable. The quantities are very large, um, but mostly occur in China because it's related to, to magnet processing. And this also drives the, the, the Chinese magnet recycling industry since they have a, a, a very large base of operation on grinding sludges and, and swaths um, to operate on at the end. The material is, is easy to access because it occurs from, from the machine. Um, it does not re require any further separation and is in most cases also homogeneously collected. Sometimes it's mixed materials uh, since various types of material categories are grinded on, sa on the same grinding machine. Post-consumer. Um, wind turbine dismantling um, becomes more and more important since decommissioning is of wind turbines is increasing over time. Um, what we see in Europe is that um, 
the amount is is increasing but um, the um, magnet containing generator uh, ratio is relatively low so we have maybe five to ten percent magnet containing generators uh, for onshore decommissioning and offshore offshore decommissioning right now is not really uh, an important topic we have once a while in from, from from testing for example that that occurs or from some accidents but uh, the standard decommissioning or replacing um, is not taking place offshore right now so the volumes are still relatively large and relatively small but it has a lot of benefits because it's homogeneous the magnet blocks are relatively big and uh, it, there's a range of reuse approaches as well uh, implemented already for these uh, for these type of magnets the hard drive mag hard drive disks um, are another very important source which has been already discussed many times um, in, in that in that industry it has the major benefit of being a very homo homogeneous uh, material type with very standard measurements uh, usually it's been separated uh, um, from PCs and servers because it contains PCBs and, and also been traded as homogeneous, uh, homogeneous lots. But the main value driver of hard drives uh, still remains to be uh, the PCB um, since the magnet content uh, of the overall um, module is relatively low. Electric motors are um, a very significant source that is still in many cases undiscovered because it comes along with a lot of challenges in, in separation and recycling. The reason is that it contains a large, there are a large variety of different designs available in the market and it's very hard to identify what electric motor actually has magnets and, and what type of magnets do they contain. These two photos are uh, from a scrapyard and uh, you can see it's very hard to identify what has a magnet and what does not have a magnet and Right now, materials have been traded based on size and, and casing type, which can be steel or aluminium. So the magnet does not really play a role in that, um, in that, uh, in that material category at this point. Um, but uh, we are working actually quite hard already since more than one and a half years to establish um, collection systems and uh, separating of the relevant permanent magnet motors from, from, the, from the other, uh, other motors. Uh, to enable a separate recycling process for that. Right now, reuse and recycling are the most common most common um, recycling routes for magnets. Disposal is usually not not really required. Sometimes it, radioactive magnets or uh, magnets that that have um, radio, radio, radioactivity occur um, that would certainly need to be disposed in a certain way but um, direct reuse or reverse logistics for reuse application are in many cases feasible when it comes to production or for refurbished parts um, that uh, occur from the ICT industry. When it comes to recycling solvent extraction is still the most common uh, common recycling route um, since the majority of materials available is grinding sludge and um, in many cases also magnet scrap that might not be uh, feasible for uh, a direct reuse or a short loop, for a short loop recycling. Um, these operations are usually customized for that specific magnet, uh, magnet stream. So we, we do not see primary and secondary um, uh, materials mixed, uh, mixed in that. That enables a relatively high a customized extraction type, which we call a short loop, a short loop solvent extraction process with uh, with a quite low cost and um, and uh, relatively high yields of up to 98 percent. So when it comes to the collection and the separation, we uh, usually have uh, four major objectives that we um, that we're trying to achieve. When it comes to um, bringing materials uh, uh, to us that that would be available for recycling, so in, in the main objective is obviously the uh, to increase the recycling efficiency of the materials and provide a very homogeneous material quality in order to to reach the, this, the necessary volumes. 
the transport and handling of the magnetized scrap is something that is uh, becoming more and more important, especially for very large, uh, large assemblies from, from wind turbines or from very large motors um, that, uh, that carry a relatively great risk of, uh, of accidents or in case of mishandling of uh, major incidents in transport, for example. In order to, to provide incentives for waste, and ge waste generators or recyclers that are needed um, to incentivize them to, uh, to do an additional collection and separation process, for example, we need, to, we need to provide them with simple collection solutions as well as um, increased monetary value that, that is significant enough for them to have, to have a real incentive or re a re added value to, uh, to implement new processes, for example. In order to do that, we usually assess the material stream on a batch by batch basis to decide, um, are we able to keep a module weight, a module, a module value or a magnet value or just the raw material value? So in, in, in order to achieve that objectives, there are, there are some challenges that, that we're facing today, such as the uh, identification of the different material types, in terms of NDFB magnets, SMC magnets, or ferrite magnets, and even the contents in that, um, on a module level, that that mostly of, in an HED drive, we obviously know that there is an NDFB magnet in there, but there are a lot of is, is, um, types of assemblies, such as electric motors, which is a, which it's very hard to identify um, what it actually contains or if it's feasible for recycling. In addition, the, the designs of products is, are getting more and more complex and more innovative hybrid materials are, uh, are in place nowadays, um, such as carbon, carbon fiber or, um, or glass fiber materials that are connected with magnets, um, which makes it a treatment uh, or a separation not, uh, not easier, let's put it that way. Um, the, the new innovations that have been driving the magnet industry in the last 10 years was great for the was great for the consumer to drive down the cost of the magnet, um, but it also had a bad impact on the on the recovery value and therefore on in in, in some cases on the feasibility of recycling. Um, and that comes to the next point that in in in, in a few cases the, the benefits of the conventional collection and separation just outweigh the benefits of uh, the, the separation itself. So. In order to um, to tackle these challenges, um, what uh, what what should be done is to um, to implement a legal framework that that requires a mandatory recovery for recyclers as well as for uh, for production facilities, which we have in place already. For example, for batteries, um, that that would certainly have have a great impact on volumes, but all, would also have a a great impact on on the on the cost of collection that some that somehow needs to be carried then by the consumer or uh, by some collection scheme at the end. Um, when it comes to the identification of modules, we are working right now to develop a database um, based on a deep learning approach that is based on um, on our uh, on our internal database on contents and photos that we have to identify, especially for electric motors. In a, in a very in a very fast pace, which which module or which electric motor contains magnets and what what magnets are most likely uh, in in this in this type of module. Design for recycling should play should and must play a great role in in, in the future, especially for um, for electric motors for EV drive trains, um, since since this uh, since the design of the of the electric motor really defines the cost of separation or even a reuse case. So just uh, just give an example, surface mounted magnets on rotors usually have um, have a far lower uh, separation cost than uh, embedded on grave magnets. We have implemented specialized collection programs uh, to target these specific magnet streams from pre and post consumer, such as uh, MagCycle that we have founded in 2018 to collect small volumes. We also have a program in, in, in place for larger assemblies uh, where we provide shielded systems, um, for example, for up to, uh, up, up to nine tons uh, of, of roller systems. 
um, in order to, to drive down the cost of collection and also for separation, the centralized semi-automatic disassembly is required, especially in the Western world, uh, to enable um, a cost covering approach on disassembly. And in order to do that, we usually uh, use a, a system to assess um, the, the material stream on a batch by batch basis uh, that uses different factors such as module design or the variable content, not only the magnet, but also, for example, copper or PCBs uh, that have a certain downstream potential. And then we come up with a solution either for a manual separation or for an automotive separation. In many cases, it is a, it is a mixture of both approaches, for example, a manual pre-concentration followed by a by a stamping process, for example, for uh, uh, to to increase the con the, the magnet con uh, magnet content of an uh, of a separated uh, part or piece. The, the future trends and and developments that we're seeing right now is um, the, the first one it comes it comes mainly from China. We see considerations of um, uh, of various departments and mainly driven by the environmental department to reclassify uh, selected scrap materials uh, as raw materials uh, to enable the import to China again, which is, um, which is a movement that is, that, is, that is somehow going against or is controversial to the policy that we have seen in the last couple of years. We're trying more, we're seeing more and more restrictions on import of metal scrap, plastics and paper. Um, but recently there are considerations for copper and aluminum to allow the um, the import as raw materials, so going away from a waste classification uh, to China again. There is no discussion on rare earth right now, but uh, if the if there would be a discussion on in classification as raw materials, that would that would have a a great impact on the global rare earth recycling industry, since there is a, a scrap import a ban on scrap imports to China in place more than eight years. And in China, there are, there are large uh, overcapacities also in recycling um, that would certainly increase the, magnet, the, the global magnet value in general, but uh, would also have an impact on the uh, yeah, global competition level of the recycling industry. We're seeing steadily increasing uh, permanent magnet scrap volumes in the market at, at a pace of 10, 15% per year, um, but not seeing an exponential growth uh, as we see that in, in, in battery. For example, and this is mainly driven by the by by wind power as well as automotive applications, and um, well, automotive applications from EV to EV uh, from EV drivetrains is, is something that slowly slowly is picking up, but it's more from production. Um, what will happen is that there will be no one-stop solutions or one one streamlined solutions for recycling. What we are seeing already right now is the assessment of, uh, of specific uh, material streams to assess reuse cases and various types of recycling cases. So it will be a variety of different type of reuse and recycling solution depending on the quality uh, of, the, um, of the module or magnet scrub available. Over the, the, the short and midterm, we're still seeing that it's relatively challenging to establish a large scale recycling uh, of, of magnet scrap in uh, outside of China, since the volumes are still relatively small um, in comparison, and there is a, a dependency on, on an of end of, end of life stream. So the Chinese recyclers have the, um, the slurries and the slacks from production as a baseline, and usually use the the, the end of life magnet scrap as an as an add on, which gives them more flexibility on uh, on, um, on capacity, more flexibility on their on the process in general. And uh, at last, we are seeing a greater consumer awareness um, that 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 trickles down um, to uh, to the to initiatives from OEMs to establish reuse programs for production and also end of life uh, materials. And uh, that in general drives from, from the industry as well from the consumer, um, the expectations for the, uh, towards the corporate environmental responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonard, for your presentation. It was very interesting insight on the market for uh, scrubs and also on the different uh, pathway 
to perform the recycling of the mag of, of the permanent magnets. And uh, uh, if we have question, uh, I, I think Nabil, we can open now uh, the floor for questions. One question, maybe from my side, Luke Pez from uh, Rare Earth Advisory again. Um, yeah. Uh, what do you think uh, is needed, therefore, for, uh, let's say, uh, Western countries, Europe in particular, uh, maybe to develop uh, permanent magnet recycling at a proper scale? I mean, do you need uh, regulation, probably, and funds? Yes. Um, so, as, as I said, the, uh, uh, to compare that to the Chinese recycling industry is um, is relatively difficult because they are re they're, re they're really based on on, on, on pre-consumer materials from production and used end of life as an add-on, which give give them a, a significant advantage in scale and uh, and and planning. Um, in, in outside of China, yes, there are some streams available from production. But obviously, having a, an existing uh, magnet manufacturing industry in place would certainly also um, uh, would be supportive for the for the magnet industry, magnet recycling industry as well, um, since there is enough materials. So when it comes to end of life policies, should be in place. But um, even they are in place, there is not really enough materials on the market that that would be really uh, that would be feasible for recycling in a way that. Uh, that would justify the cost as well that way. Where do you put the cost to uh, implement a recycling facility with uh, hydromet, uh, you know, technology to keep it uh, standard? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, talking really about the. Um, th th there, there are certainly feas there's feasibility to establish a recycling process. The, uh, th the issue that I see right now is more into into collecting and separating the materials. Um, in in Europe, for example, and yeah. to have materials on on, on site, uh, to have a significant supply of materials available. So it's more the the, the but real bottleneck beyond the availability of uh, slags, which obviously uh, you don't have so much. That's correct. So from from like to to consider a ratio, what we collect in Europe is usually seventy percent production and thirty percent end of life. Okay, so it's more about yep. the whole dismantling and uh, collecting part of the business, which you think is uh, the real bottleneck. If I uh, yes, correct. Summarize. So I, I'm I'm sure there there is actually already enough technology in the in the market to establish a, a feasible recycling, and also enough efforts already in place uh, on a political level. But what we see right now uh, is that there is just not enough materials in the market to to build something that could be that could be comparable to a Chinese facility that runs on the ones we now run up to, up to 15,000 tons per year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Leonard, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, let me check, yeah. What is the volume of e-oil scrap being captured by Rocklink today? And also within that e-oil, how much is the magnet? And uh, and you have and the second question is and uh, do you have any idea of how much magnet are currently recycled in commercial scale in China? Okay, so on uh, on on Rocklink's figure, it's a it's a few hundred tons that that we collect on a global scale. So not on, not on Euro, we we mostly collect them from um, from Asia. Um, in China, it's 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 very hard because there's no really, not really statistics about that, and and also when it comes to recycling in general, there's no no breakdown on pre or post consumer, for example. Um, but there should be definitely more volume available, also from decommissioning of of wind generators, because the percentage of on of onshore wind generators in China that contain magnets significantly larger than, for example, in Europe. Because they 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 um, in the in the past couple of fifteen to twenty years they implemented or established more uh, PM generators uh, on in in China 
that are available for, for decommissioning right now. So it, sh it should be probably, and also the end of life. So H for, for example, HED drives in China, they are fully fully disassembled to, to uh, an completely un, uh, also on the, on the magnet level. So there should be certainly more than 2000 tons or even more available in the market. Thank you, Leonard. Any other questions? Uh, for your presentation and also for uh, the answer to the question. I mean, uh, I find it very interesting because it was one part of the uh, red, earth mark, uh, red earth market I was not very knowledgeable about. So I found uh, your presentation very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I think we now uh, move uh, forward with the webinar and um, uh, we'll have Alexander Burgeri from uh, GLMAG, uh, who will talk to us uh, about uh, recycling, but particularly uh, on uh, designing for recycling, because as uh, we have just uh, heard from uh, uh, Leonard, uh, it is very important. Uh, one of the main problems in recycling is actually extracting the magnets uh, from the from the components, let's say that, uh, in order to allow for the magnet to be recycled. So I was working for 12 years for a tier one supplier and was responsible for a lot of, um, let's say, material selections and also material topics for neodymium iron bowon. And I just want to show the presentation. Why does it not work? Ah, perfect. So um, let's say I have a very good view from a customer point of view for the selection of neodymium ion bowon and also from sourcing of raw material as well for the, uh, issues as like recycling and so on. And beginning of this year, I changed my working field and I was going to JLMAC and uh, work now for a magnet supplier, the biggest one in China one of the biggest one and uh, let's say I have now a picture from both uh, points of view and it's um, let's say a quite difficult story um, how a suitable design for recycling really looks like. So I just want to give you some um, applications using neodymium iron bowong and then I want to tell you something about a, a recycling chain and uh, where to target on for recycling um, in the production chain of a man, uh, magnet manufacturer and also what comes from this recycling chain um, as a requirement to, um, to the design for the magnets for the recycling. So um, what we see here is um, the annual report from our company in 2018. It looks quite similar also for many of our competitors. So let's, uh, since um, last year, I was also a customer for our competitors. Yeah, so everybody have a big fraction of wind turbine, wind power, a big fraction for automotive industry, household, uh, what we call 3C electronics, so consumer electronics, um, cell phones, and so on. And also a big, uh, huge one is uh, automation um, uh, industry. So let's say first, what is uh, going on? So what was already mentioned before, um, we let's say um, the demand for neodymium ion boron is um, everywhere um, increasing. Interesting point is that in the next 10 years, it is really expected, um, and I fully agree, um, that the, um, the share of the consumption will go to the majority of the drive train. So also the others will increase for sure, but not as significantly as like the electrification. And this will have a um, big impact um, on the um, available, um, let's say, magnet geometries and materials, which will be um, later on on the market and uh, should get back to the recycling. <clears throat> so one problem is um, that, um, let's say, roughly 90% um, of the neodymium ion bowen is uh, manufactured in China. And only roughly 10% is outside. To make it more complex, um, Almost two thirds of this is going outside of China and going to the different applications. So either we support the magnets directly to our customers, or uh, we make also full products in China and send them outwards. And um, let's say we are still uh, expect that this number will also um, increase with time. But the problem is now, 
what was also mentioned before, we have four magic metals for neodymium ion bar one. So we have pisodium and neodymium. So all magnets have them, all kinds of neodymium magnets. There's no one without one of them. And for high temperature um, application, um, there's a necessity for terbium as well as for dysposium. And we see here for these figures that um, in latest five years, we will have a big uh, deficit for the um, heavy rare earths, in particular for dysprosium, but we also um, expect from our point of view that we will also get critical for terbium in future. So let's say um, at a certain point there will come pressure from markets that also recycling gets, um, let's say, um, feasible from cost point of view. So coming to the recycling chain. Um, currently, we have uh, the separation of the material via certain steps to carbonite, oxide, the metal, and uh, I'm then going to a neodymium iron bone manufacturer. <clears throat> and then from here, it stays either in China or go outside from China to the um, different supplier uh, customers who produce the final apl um, application. So let's say with um, from sustainability uh, point of view, if you want to start recycling uh, with a uh, neodymium bone magnet, so from um, the later in the production chain you insert um, for recycling, the better is the energy consumption and the uh, chemical consumption because if you really um, bring back everything to the metal extraction, you have a lot uh, more um, energy and chemical consumption instead of, for example, reusing. Reusing means we put out the magnets in total, maybe some for uh, fine grinding, changing the to adapting the tolerances, coating again and bring back um, to, uh, to a customer and he reuse it directly. So this should be much more um, efficient from sustainability point of view. And um, this is also from a manufacturing point of view, handable. Yeah. So the big question now is from the application to which point of this whole production chain bring the, um, the uh, field reclaim from customer. So one important point here is that China prohibits the importation of used items. It's more or less not possible to bring used magnets back to the magnet uh, manufacturer industry. So everything what is inside China we can collect and there are also a lot of activities, for example, for wind turbine. So a big fraction of them we can recycle. We can use, um, reuse them, make a powderization, reuse the powder and can bring back into um, the circle. But uh, once um, an article really um, left China, then we have the problem that we cannot really bring it back because it's not a raw material as like an ore or carbonate and oxide, something like this. It's declared as scrap waste, however. And um, yeah, so here we have the big problem and uh, market um, impact. If we want to produce um, recycled material outside of China, we have to build up um, the uh, production chain outside of China. And here's, um, let's say, a big problem. Currently, in particular, the EV business is very, very cost-driven. Cost-driven means um, you need um, to be very, very cheap with your application. Um, and um, our customers discuss always with us, so what is about sourcing outside of China with your raw materials? Also, what are your recycling activities? And then we can tell them, oh, we have a lot of uh, recycling activities also within our production chain. But the problem is, finally, after a lot of discussions, drinking a lot of coffee, um, an e-auction takes place and the cheapest price counts. So this is a current situation. And until this does not end, it is not really feasible for a Chinese company to make a um, factory um, outside of um, China to say, okay, we collect um, the waste and uh, we manufacture it. So this is uh, the current price situation here. So um, the recycling for China, gets important for sure, but um, currently the pain from price point of view is not big enough. But if we have a look on what I showed before for the um, 
deficit of the material, um, it will get an interesting situation in a few years. So from, um, let's say for um, recycling, there's already established a traditional way bring everything back uh, to the metal extraction. So we have a lot of uh, different steps from casting, pulverizing, pressing, sintering, machining, and also from coating. So we have scrap and slurry inside our company and we can bring it back um, to, of course, to the um, metal extraction. This is not a big problem in this case. But the problem here is that the customer field we claim um, is prohibited to insert and we cannot um, use this um, in China, at least um, the powder outside of um, um, the scrap outside from China. So if we think about um, um, production line outside of China, it must be as short as possible because each process you bring from China outside to Europe or somewhere else will get more and more expensive. And it uh, gets more important to um, start as late as possible in the production chain of the magnet. So um, from a um, sustainability point of view, if we bring everything back to the metal extraction, we will have the cost and uh, chemical consumption from the very first beginning um, through all the steps, uh, um, steps until we have a final production step, uh, final um, magnet. On the other side, if we um, bring back the customer field we claim into the chain, um, the later we introduce it, we have a higher requirements concerning damages on magnets um, from removal outside. So if there are big um, chips and brakes or not, we cannot use it for remanufacturing, for remachining and coating. And also um, a lot of applications as for example, hard disk drives have a very high requirement for the cleanliness. So let's say the later we use um, the magnets in the production chain, the higher the sustainability and also um, yeah, the price finally, because we have uh, reduced a lot of uh, expensive steps um, outside of China. So how to handle the customer field reclaim? So we have in principle an application disassembly. This is either destructive or non-destructive. In case it is non-destructive, so for example, we just um, are able to push out the magnet out of a rotor, or we will just remove a clamp. We can do an easy cleaning of the magnet and can remanufacture it or directly reuse, depending on how the magnet really looks like. And um, in case um, that we have, um, let's say, a lot of different ma uh, material, um, a mixture of it, we can also pulverize it and blend with a new powder to target properties, and then we can go to pressing and so on. In case of destructive disassembly, it's uh, quite more difficult because um, for destructive disassembly, usually we have a lot of impurities which disturb uh, um, a lot of our processes afterwards. Yeah. So let's say um, if we really crush um, the whole assembly, for example, as like a rotor, you can only go to a metal extraction and this is not uh, really um, uh, let's say the best point from the, uh, from the sustainable recycling. If we crash out the magnets, for example, by hydrogen that uh, crepitation, I think we will later on hear um, something about this. We also have the problem that we get a big um, amount of, uh, let's say more or less pure neodymium I'm born on, but it's depending heavily um, what are the impurities and how does they look like. In principle, the less imp um, impurities, the higher the material grade, which will come on later on and the purer the material is, the less we have to blend with new powder. So if we really want to uh, recycle um, the powder, um, yeah, we have to blend finally to get a competitive material because the uh, initial material always um, lost some of its uh, properties. And uh, the more um, clean the powder is, the less we need uh, for new material. In case we have uh, removal with, let's say, a bulk material, at least we have the possibility to uh, make a powderization and also some um, remanufacturing. So let's make the story some more complex. Um, if we have a look on the material table for a magnet supplier, we have different, a lot of different grades and a lot of different materials and a lot of different target temperatures to make this quite more complex. So if you just bring us um, a big container with, let's say, two tons of neodymium iron boron, we have really to ask for which kind of material is it? 
So we are heavily depending on, um, let's say, a labeling, um, which kind of material um, is given back to us. And this is also for the um, uh, disassembly chain before quite um, important to know. So if we look here um, for the um, different, um, let's say, um, customers and fields, well, which kind of materials they use, we see that, uh, let's say, from the landscape of materials we provide, almost everything is in use somewhere. So for wind power, we see that they have um, heavy rare earth free materials in focus and uh, very high remnants material. So this is uh, completely different uh, in comparison to EM, HEB or EV. So here we have um, the highest um, coercivities, highest temperature um, for operation and also um, with um, the highest um, demand for disposal and turbium. And um, also quite interesting is the automotion sector. Um, this is a quite conservative um, industry which do not really um, look for the most upper um, top materials from remnants point of view or development point of view. They use uh, materials where they have experience with. But um, we have a problem if we have such materials and we want to get um, something for automotive and so on. It's a big issue to really to pimp up the powder that we get, a um, let's say, competitive material. So this um, industry, from our point of view, also needs to go up to the upper materials um, in order to enable um, better recycling for uh, good materials, which are also used for the other markets as well. So let's have a look for the design of e-power generation. Uh, whether it's uh, wind power, water power, tidal power, whatever. So these magnets have big dimensions and have one big advantage. Um, these uh, applications are not uh, changing their um, location. They are somewhere in the world and um, it's uh, relatively easy to see which kind of machine it is and to remove uh, the different magnet grades and also to separate whether it is an SH material, H material or whatever. Uh, also, due to the big dimensions, um, it's easy in case um, to say, okay, even if it is slightly damaged, uh, we can still cut it in smaller pieces and can remanufacture it. Or um, another advantage is we have, a, in a short time, a lot of the same material, uh, which we can do an um, easy blending with new power and go to, for example, also in combination with GBD to um, higher material grades um, in cursivity, which are used for automotive. So let's say finally the um, e-power has an advantageous situation for the recycling because we have uh, big magnets and also the disassembly um, is uh, most times not as difficult um, as like an example for small um, application as like 3C electronics. So here we have also um, higher uh, remnants material, but we have a lot of, um, yeah, let's say, distribution of the material. It's uh, everywhere in the world available, but the uh, mixture of grades makes it quite more difficult really to select the material and to get a um, certain amount of, for example, a 56SH material in a big amount. You will always have a mixture. And also from the design point of view, here's a very, very, uh, a uh, disadvantage that we, um, let's say, uh, the next generation of a cell phone has half a millimeter less in thickness. So we have here a very big, um, let's say, density of the different components. And um, uh, to make it the components as like neodymium removable, it's, let's say, rather impossible. So I've never seen up to now a mobile phone with a reject button that the magnets just swept out. So it's very um, difficult here and also a very disadvantageous basic um, for the recycling. If we go to the household um, appliances, um, it's much more, um, let's say, um, um, desi um, design which is uh, much better for the recycling point of view because you can open it and you can um, easily remove uh, subcomponents containing the magnets. So here, this is a very good example of a rotor where you just can press on top on the magnets and put it out. Yeah, so let's say this is also an advantageous basis for the recycling, in particular if there's a lot of new material um, on the market in use, so everybody is focusing on the highest remnant material, and if we um, want to remanufacture this material um, by powderization and so on, 
we have less effort to blend with new material and to keep um, this material back um, as a magnet powder into the um, production sand in our um, facility. So um, what I told before for the um, automation business um, and elevators and all of this, um, a conservative industry which should really think about using um, the higher grades because um, in principle this powder to reuse it's uh, quite difficult. Yeah, so here I really propose that this materials um, should be on the first hand side easy to be removed but then directly go back to the uh, material extraction because there's a lot of heavy rare earth inside which is not necessary anymore for the upper materials with higher remnants. So here it is uh, more feasible to um, bring the uh, raw material directly back because it's not really feasible these materials to reuse for other applications. Automotive industry, we have to distinguish between drivetrain and non-drivetrain. So the non-drivetrain industry also has, um, let's say, media temperatures and also has sometimes quite old uh, materials as for example 35SH or 35UH which is still uh, requested by us but the problem is here that um, if you want to make a new design the customer has unfortunately to agree and this needs a lot of expensive testing so therefore um, new products are focusing on the um, upper uh, remnants whereas older materials uh, yeah uh, older products still have a look on the older materials um, unfortunately here the situation is that um, the amount of magnets um, to get out of the um, application it's not uh, quite easy and also the fraction um, of magnets is quite low so let's say for an ABS system for example so we have about 10 to 50 grams of neodymium iron bowen and the effort um, to open the housing um, is quite expensive so here it's very important that future projects enable a very fast uh, chain to get directly to the magnet components and to remove it. Coming to the most uh, important uh, business in future for the EV. EV is, uh, let's say, uh, a development driver. Everybody is looking for highest remnants and high cohesivity and uh, operation temperatures are somewhere in the range 140 to 200 degrees depending on the application. So here we will always have a heavy rare earth demand uh, which is from our point of view not uh, sub, uh, supportable without heavy rare earth this kind of materials. So from the um, reverse uh, logistic point of view we see that um, a lot of different materials are in use and um, if we want to reuse it we really need a strong labeling um, that we can really uh, say okay okay we have here a 54 UH we can collect this material and blend it to another one after um, it's coming back and on the other side um, there's a big um, mainstream going to um, epoxy coating for electrical um, insulation of the magnets and of course, um, yeah, also um, let's say putting um, additional um, plastics around to for fixation of the magnets and this is something uh, coming back to the um, let's say recycling. If we really want to get the powder back and we have a lot of uh, carbon content on top of the magnets or uh, coming to the powder finally if we uh, powderize it, we have the big problem that is this um, carbon significantly reduce um, the cohesivity of the material unfortunately not in a really predictable way but in a um, disturbing one and um, if the powder has a lot of um, additional ele elements as like uh, coming from glue molding and so on we have the problem that is we cannot reuse the magnet and we have directly bring it back to the metal extraction so from an economical impact and this attempt simply cost reduction you really have to look that you have a fast um, opening of the housing, a fast removal of the relevant uh, component uh, containing the magnet and also the fixation itself. So if possible you should really prefer clamp springs or something like this because everything else which is covering the magnet you will get impurities which will later on uh, make it rather impossible to reuse um, the magnet as a powder. And um, due to the 
um, recycling cost reduction. It's also um, uh, really necessary that we get uh, big uh, batches together. If we have only small amounts and we really have to think about what is the powder material um, the grade type, and then we have to re-blend it, and we have this to do for many, many batches. It's a very big cost impact. So we usually should have a big uh, batch sizes that we have less effort um, for, let's say, um, re, um, re-blending of the um, magnet material. So for the powderization enabling, we should really uh, collect uh, same or similar grades in the certain batches we get. And also we should have a material label somewhere on the application that um, somebody is able to um, separate the materials um, that we get it, um, let's say, more or less collected um, do not have uh, the lowest and the highest cohesivity material um, because then it's a complete uh, rather impossible to make new material with certain properties. But we have always a mixture of all of this and this is, um, let's say, wasting of material. Um, so, in particular, um, to everybody, um, please have a look that you don't have carbon um, residues on the magnet, in particular um, on the powder. And if you want to reuse or remanufacturing, you will, should really think about platform designs with similar or same magnets, grades, and geometries, and uh, keep uh, for the easy geometry. So, let's say if you have an arc shape, you will never have a new application with the same radius. But um, let's say for block magnets, if you want to remanufacture, it's um, yeah a lot uh, easier task for regrinding and redimensioning in comparison to an arc shape or ring magnet or something like this. And uh, for corrosion point of view, also corrosion is an impurity which takes place. And if you coat the magnet itself, we have to remove the coating and we will always have some impurities. If we avoid the corrosion on the machine level, that the corrosion does not uh, come to the magnet itself, so the magnet can be uncoated, will also significantly improve um, the um, recycling point of view in this case. And also, if you want to um, reuse the magnets, you should really think about lower cursivity. So you have the high pressure anyway because of the cost and the heavy earth demand. But if you want to reuse and uh, remagnetize the magnet, if it was once magnetized, um, the uh, neodymium bone has a disadvantage that you need higher fields for remagnetizing. So also you should really um, have a focus um, from the reuse point of view uh, that you have a lower cursivity. Okay, so I think time is now over. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Very good presentation, very visual. A lot of good information that I will uh, be able to take away from this. Um, I have a question in regards to um, your slide number seven on rare earth market balance. You show there the balance between deficit and surplus, um, for which uh, this starting, I think, 2025 forward will be um, in the uh, deficit zone. Um, I'm wondering if there are other, um, if there are other, uh, others, uh, rare earth metals especially on the heavier side that would eventually be in the in the deficit zone um i don't see anything there in terms of uh, holmium or thuliums um any any uh, feedback you would have for that so let's say um um the next step is um to replace with holmium but holmium has from our point of view many disadvantages from the performance point of view so um, the better performance we get with our production process and our production uh, techniques with a uh, dysposium or terbium. So let's say holmium is similar to dysposium, but um, we do not really get uh, the uh, performance as like um, holmium. Uh, sorry, as like with dysposium. So there's slight deficit and uh, oh, sorry, slight reduction of the performance, and therefore it's not in focus for us currently. But if it is later on coming, um, let's say, magnet powder with um, holmium inside, uh, we can deal with this um, by blending with other materials to get the final um, um, possible uh, magnet performance. So it's not, it's not deterred us, but we don't have it um, in our focus. But it's also uh, possible to reuse magnets uh, containing this type of uh, metal. Thank you. Michelle Lynch from Enable Future Limited. Yeah, it was an excellent presentation. In fact, all the presentations were really excellent. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on um, the effects that you anticipate on 
rare earth prices from the fact that we will have dynamics where the demand will be growing at quite a fast rate then you have more primary capacity coming online and recycling capacity do you see that how how do you see recycling helping to stabilize the market and the prices difficult issue we don't know really how the world will look like in five years yeah so we only see a demand and we all also see that uh, we will uh, go to a deficit situation and uh, the question is where uh, the material is coming from so we expect that the price will increase for sure but uh, the question is how the market will react and just coming to um, alternatives for ev um, you can always say somewhere there's a break even point in a project to make either um, design a or design b and this is also the case for the recycling um, there's uh, somewhere a break even that is uh, suitable to take um, more recycling material or um, less uh, recycling material this depends on the um, price point of view so currently the raw material is quite cheap and the market still has many of the uh, possibilities to um, react for example you can also go to a, a electrical synchronous machine for ev and uh, can compensate the demand that you go also back to a surplus situation in principle it's really difficult to say so it's quite complex issues the only point what i can say is currently we discussed with our customer from the um, recycling installation and so on nobody is really willing now um, to pay more in the um, comparison to the current chinese prices so it's very interesting um, how the situation will change when the deficit really appears in future so we have um, the technology in-house for recycling activities and if the pressure and the pain for customers high enough to say okay we also pay higher prices for recycling outside of china um, then we can install a, a factory lab also outside but currently we do not really see that we will have this in five years but uh, ask me in one year and i will maybe tell you a complete different stories sure yeah i, I think it highlights the uncertainties and the need for a more comprehensive view of um, capacity and the potential for different ways to um, cope with the changing pattern and the potential for deficits. Yeah. Difficult so let's for recyclers to plan on the on this basis. So is there was interruption? Was there one more question? So I, I was just saying it, it seems like it will be very difficult for recyclers to business plan unless there is much more clarity about how the market will go, how they will compensate for any deficits, what sort yeah. of um, mechanisms can be used to, to um, compensate and how can recyclers plan around this. No. So let's say at least two thirds of the material uh, neodymium iron bone which is produced will get has to be somewhere recycled outside from China. If now somebody in China um, decides, oh, um, importation of neodymium iron bone is um, allowed, of used one, uh, then the situation can uh, immediately change completely. Yeah. So digital inputs um, from politics um, can have big impacts and. Uh, throw around the whole of the world in this case so for example if uh, Europe says um, 50 percent of the neodymium iron bone has to be recycled but uh, looks completely different as a uh, current point of view so from current point of view um, still china production is a, uh, the cheapest one and let's wait what will happen uh, when we get into the deficit situation thank you rob you have a comment to make Yes, I have a small comment to make here. Um, of course, it is yeah. very difficult to make uh, any projection as to the price levels that will occur uh, in future. One of the things we have to bear in mind that there is a geopolitical situation and this geopolitical situation will always have its impact on this uh, price and on the availability. And uh, taking that into account, um, it is very clear that uh, last week uh, the European Union has uh, launched IRMA uh, because one of the reasons is that Europe is becoming quite uh, dependent on other sources and uh, needs to reconsider this dependency. Uh, 
only this comes with a price. And if you don't want to pay the price, like uh, uh, Dr. Fagiri has said previously, then in, in, uh, it will be a long time before you will become more independent. Yes, thank you, Rob. That's really interesting. Yes. So, mm. like we always say, sustainability comes with a price. Yeah. Okay, thank you very well, uh, everyone, for the contribution to this uh, discussion following the presentation. It was, uh, I mean, uh, very interesting. And uh, so we now move forward and uh, we introduce uh, Nick Mann from iPromark. Uh, which uh, will talk us uh, about the mini root, routes through which neodymium iron boron magnetic materials can be recycled and, uh, and he will particularly focus on the pathway that uh, uh, IPROMAG is following. Hi Nick. Uh, hello. Uh, Hi. You see if I yeah. can share my screen? Yeah. Uh, no, no, we can, can you share again? Not, uh, yet your screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now we Good. can see it. So you, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, so uh, I hope you can see the main screen with the presentation. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, yeah, thank you for the invite to speak. Um, I think over the next 20 minutes, I hope to uh, show you a little bit about the uh, the what, the why, the how, and the where of, of Hypermag Limited. Um, so the the what i think is quite simple to explain it's all on this first slide uh we're a new company uh we're licensing a patented process developed at the university of birmingham uh, school of metallurgy and materials which is uh known as hy hydrogen processing of magnetic scrap that's uh, hpms um it's designed for us to short loop recycle sintered NDFEB and that's really what our, our whole focus is on. Uh, so uh, why recycle rare earth magnets? Um, I think we've uh, hit some on this for some for some of the previous things. Um, EU is estimated to import around 14,000 tonnes of NDFEB magnetic products per year. Um, at the moment, almost all of that is from China. Um, the economics of recycling become more favourable using a short loop process. Um, and I'll, the next slide will hopefully highlight that a little bit. Um, there's also potentially a much smaller environmental footprint than primary using recycling and especially with a short loop recycling. Um, and again, the next slide will hopefully highlight that. Uh, we hope to provide a secure supply of materials for the EU. That uh, obviously there's a big dependency on on the Chinese supply at the moment, um, and I know of several companies that would like to mitigate against that. Um, and we believe the cost for building a recycling plant uh, will be a, a fraction of that than required for primary production, and we think we can achieve it on a much shorter time scale. So just a, a generic flow chart for the production. It's not dissimilar to some of the ones we've seen in the previous presentations. We've got um, a mine to magnets, which we've split into sort of mine to oxide, oxide to metal, metal to magnet. Um, it's very limited recycling at the moment. Um, and what recycling there is, is quite often going back in at the chemical processing or solvent extraction stages. So you can see in that, in that diagram there's still quite a long way to get to your final magnet from that point. Um, what we're concentrating on is taking that end of life magnet and putting it back between the casting stage and the magnet manufacture stage. Um, obviously by doing that we're missing a lot of steps there which use both um, energy and chemicals uh, so we can reduce that, that the cost of the processing um, and also the, 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 the embedded carbon of the final magnet. So uh, problems, and again, some of the previous talks have highlighted these very, very well. So identification of products which contain the NDFEB magnets is not always easy. Um, so one example I could give is uh, flat screen TVs. Um, the, the 
stereo speakers in a flat screen TV, we think about two thirds of those contain NDFEB magnets. Um, one third are just ferrite magnets, um, no rare earth involved, but it's very difficult to say without disassembling that TV, which type of magnet is in that speaker. Um, so when you're looking at each speaker containing maybe six grams to 10 grams of, of, of uh, NDFEB scrap, but you don't know whether it does or not. It's a time consuming thing to work out whether that's a, a recycl recyclable magnet. Um, magnets are often very small. So we've seen the mobile phone already in a presentation and we'd expect around 300 milligrams of NDFEB in a, in a typical mobile phone. Um, again, it's not very much for that disassembly. Um, composition of the magnets is changing, again, highlighted very well in previous uh, previous talks. Um, so if you just look at a single a single um, thing like a hard disk drive voice coil magnet, um, year to year and manufacturer to manufacturer, the composition of that magnet is different every time. So you're never quite sure what the magnet is that you're starting with. Uh, end of life magnets are, are usually coated and have a higher oxygen content than primary alloys. Um, these are both things that we have to overcome with what we're doing. We have to find a way of getting through that coating, um, of breaching that coating. Um, and we also have to be very careful to keep that oxygen content under control. It's uh, obviously very detrimental to the final properties of the magnet. Um, at the moment, a lot of magnets end up in rice recycling facilities that separate using shredders. Um, I was recently at an automotive uh, recycling centre where they shred the car um, and the magnets, the NDFEB magnets just disintegrate and they stick to everything. They stick to the ferrous scrap, uh, they stick to the shredder itself, they stick to the steel work of the recycling plant. Um, even if you could claim that scrap somehow it's it's no good for hyper an hour process at that point uh, most products are not designed for disassembly that's uh, been highlighted well as uh, again it's getting to those components is difficult i'll show you a little bit on the next slide um, economics recycling are challenging again that's it's uh, there's a lot of cost involved in getting these magnets out of their application um and it, yeah if the scrap is suddenly very expensive then you're you're already on the back foot to produce a cost effective magnet uh, and supply chain is small in the eu um again there's uh, because there's a small amount of manufacturing um there's no real scrap supply um and the whole thing needs developing further so some examples um so at the top left is the hard disk drive. Um, and obviously to get to that point, it's come out of a computer, or <coughs> excuse me, or out of a, a data storage device of some sort. Um, so it's already been, had screws removed, then the screws removed from the casing to get to this point. At the top left, you can see the voice coil magnet assembly that's still held in place with screws and the assembly itself is held together with screws um, for maybe 10 grams of, uh, of NDFEB, it's a lot of work to get to this point. Um, <clears throat> a, a rotor from an automotive drive motor. Um, these magnets are actually all held in with epoxy. They're almost impossible to remove cleanly um, and very difficult to get at. Um, and then the mobile phone, <clears throat> a huge amount of disassembly to get to this point. And then, as I said on the previous slide, we'd only expect maybe 300 milligrams of NDFEB at that point. So the pictures at the bottom of this slide highlight the uh, shredding problem. So the bottom left, you can, I don't know if the resolution is good enough that you can see how furry that looks, but that's uh, disintegrated NDFEB all stuck to the ferrous scrap um, and very impossible to, to claim. <clears throat> so if we move on to look more closely at the voice coil magnets um, from the hard disk drives. So the top left picture here you can see is the uh, the removed assembly. 
So that's uh, that's a, a ferrous casing um, which is holding holding a magnet. There's two of those back to back with uh, some plastic spacers. Um, you can see what the voice coil magnet itself looks like in the bottom picture. So that's a nickel plated magnet um, which is glued to the uh, the ferrous casing. And then the top right picture shows um, what that looks like after we've put it through a hydrogen reaction process. Um, you can see the the NDFEB, which has become a more of a powder. You can see the the ferrous casing, and you can see the the nickel plating that's come away from the magnet. So I can show you this process. Um, so this is at the University of Birmingham, where they've put one of those voice coil assemblies into a vessel with hydrogen coming in. Um, you can maybe just about see on this magnet where we've introduced just a bit of damage to get through the, the nickel coating. Um, and that means that the hydrogen can get into the MDFEB um, and the, the reaction can initiate. So there's two important things with this reaction. Um, it causes a volume increase, which causes the magnet to fall about a part further. Um, and it also demagnetizes the powder. So if I show you what happens, you can see the reaction propagating through. And if we show you just the magnet itself, you can see that reaction propagating through the, the magnet as the, uh, as the grains split apart and the coating cracks, the, uh, the reaction can propagate through the magnet. So the University of Birmingham have been in other projects where they've developed um, processing lines. Uh, one of the processing lines that was developed in the product in, in the previous project was a cropping machine for hard disk drives. So they developed a robotic line which can detect where that voice coil magnet is in the hard disk assembly. Um, it can rotate that assembly and crop the corner that contains the voice coil magnet. So we can load those corners into a porous drum. The porous drum can be placed inside a vessel um, and then the vessel can be filled with, with uh, hydrogen for the reaction that you just previously saw on the previous slide to take place. So the, uh, as the powder is generated from the reaction, it can fall through the holes in the porous drum um, and it comes down into a collection pot at the bottom of the vessel. So those holes in that porous drum are about three millimeters in diameter. So that means that the material that we get out uh, contains everything which is, has got a size smaller than three millimeters. Um, so there's nickel flakes in this powder, there's um, occasional small screws, there's bits of plastic. Um, but when you look at the, the lumps of NDFEB that have come through, that reaction has taken place even through those larger lumps of NDFEB. Um, and the, you can see the grains are starting to split in the middle picture. Um, so then we can, we can do a mechanical sieving um, using some, some uh, steel balls just to help break that NDFEB up further. Um, the NDFEB breaks apart more preferentially to anything else that's there and we can basically sieve out the nickel coating, we can sieve out the plastics and the, and the screws um, and we end up with a, a relatively pure NDFEB powder which can then go back into the magnet manufacturing process. So again we can mill or sieve that powder further as we need to, um, blend as we need to, uh, we can then uh, pulse a line and press um, and then this into the shaping and the magnetizing of the end product to make a new magnet out of that recycled powder. So I think that covers the, the, uh, the what, the why and the how. So just finally touch on the where. So uh, as I've mentioned the University of Birmingham several times, during this uh, presentation uh, and we're tied very heavily with together with them at the moment so um, we're involved in several projects together uh, and we're through the D 
different projects, we've got a reasonable amount of, of money to develop the initial pilot scale uh, process at the University of Birmingham. So over the next 18 to 24 months, we intend to have a pilot scale plant completed at the University of Birmingham. Uh, we then have identified a site at Tisley, which is five miles away from, from the university, where we intend to go to full commercialization. Um, we're lead partner in several of the projects, in two, in two of the projects that we're involved with, we're lead partner, um, and we've only been able to achieve that with uh, investment from Maganito, which is a, a subsidiary of Makango Resources and Telaxis. So we're pleased that, that they wanted to get on board and, and help us through this journey. So just quickly on these photos, the top photo here is the, the plasma building at the University of Birmingham. This is currently being refurbished to house the pilot, the initial pilot line. Um, so on the right hand side is where the equipment will all end up for the production. Uh, the left hand side is offices and a characterization lab. Uh, and then the bottom picture shows the site for the commercialization. Um, there's an area in pink, uh, which is the location of a new building, which is, is being built by the University of Birmingham. Um, and it's looking at uh, scale-up projects around um, around circular economy. So we think is a good fit for us to move there as well. Um, there'll be a characterization lab as part of that new building. Um, but also on this site and around this site is a large recycling plant, um, some energy generation, and a hydrogen production facility for uh, hydrogen buses that are being used around Birmingham. So we think there's a, an opportunity at that site to, to scale up further. Um, so I think that pretty much sums everything up. So it's just thank you. Um, thank you to the University of Birmingham uh, and Macango and Talaxis and uh, thank you all for listening. And thank you so much. And I open the floor for the questions. Is there any questions from the audience? I have a question. Yep, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, my name is Jack Blumen. For um, from uh, from the uh, perspective of looking outside uh, of what's going on, it's it's uh, very interesting and and frustrating at the same time because you're trying to figure out why uh, there is such an enormous contradiction and disparity between the producers of uh, any type of equipment or any type of gadget that contains uh, the uh, magnets or any basically rare, uh, uh, rare earth oxide uh, <clears throat> and, and basically do, couldn't care less about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fact that you have to recycle the product. It's the same thing in every industry, whether it's food, plastics and others. Uh, but here, it seems that we haven't reached a balance between uh, the ability, the availability of uh, rare earths, rare uh, oxides, and and then basically the need to produce uh, any piece of equipment that allows an easy recycling. As long as this doesn't happen, it's going to create chaos and lead eventually to a shortage of either the 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 rare earths oxides or an impossibility to, to deal with the uh, waste. And so why isn't there a, uh, an organization that basically standardizes uh, all products that use rare or oxide so that they can be then treated at the end of their cycle? Yeah, um, good question. Obviously, um, from our point of view, we hope that our process can mitigate some of those design errors because we don't need to completely separate the magnet from the assembly. If, the, if there's a little bit of volume around the magnet and if we can get to it to, to breach the coating, then we can, we can usually get a reaction to occur. Um, we're obviously very young, so we're still developing what we can, what we can um, extract and what we can't. Um, to go further into into your question, I think um, Alex in the previous pre presentation 
covered several things where the design was better um, and you could push magnets out of rotors, for example, rather than, than being epoxied into place. Um, and then again, further to that, there's now several forums looking at critical materials and especially rare earths at the moment. Um, and they are looking at uh, design for life and, and they are looking at uh, design for recycle and they're, they're looking at um, maybe uh, coming up with ways of identifying the magnets that are in each product. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not been happening, but it is starting to happen. Uh, and yeah, hopefully it's, uh, it's only going to get better. Do you see, uh, for instance, in the um, declarations made by Tesla uh, recently uh, about building a new type of batteries um, that would standardize basically the industry uh, by making the uh, batteries more uh, recycle friendly and all, uh, easier to build and cheaper? Is, do you think that this is the trend basically, uh, especially since by 2030 or even 2030 40 practically 90 percent of the cars will be electric um i think the the battery model is being used at the moment and uh to promote the sort of the way we should move forwards with with rare earths so um there's been a lot of projects around batteries over the last few years and how to how to recycle those and yeah how to develop the whole supply chain um, and it, a lot of those projects now are being quoted in, in the rare earth world. So Good. hopefully some of the lessons that they've learned in the battery world can be applied going forwards in the rare earth world. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, you, Jack. And any, uh, yeah, any other questions? So I have a question. Uh, Stan Trout here, Go Spontaneous ahead, Stan. Materials, waking up in Colorado this morning. Um, uh, two questions, actually. One comment about the last uh, uh, comment and that or last question. Uh, there is an example of uh, standard sizes in the magnet industry. Um, it's in the ceramic side of things, uh, speaker rings, and they were standardized a long time ago. Uh, my understanding, because this even predates me, uh, was that this was not an easy thing to do. Um, and I think magnet designers start off with a blank piece of paper draw whatever they want and hope somebody can make it. So uh, my question is for Nick, I guess, and, and for Alex. Uh, whenever I hear people talk about recycling, they concentrate on what I'll call the one third of stuff that they can recover and use, the rare earth part. I'm curious about what happens to all the other material. Is that, I'm gonna assume that scrap, is that an expensive proposition to get rid of that? Because two thirds of what you recover, you don't want. So, so what happens with with that? Is it a big deal or is it a, a trivial deal? Yeah, for for us, we're a, we're a young company at the moment. I can't answer that purely from a hypermag point of view. But um, as a NDFEB scrap in general, um, it it basically gets stuck to the ferrous scrap and ends up, I guess, going off to to a blast furnace somewhere to refine that steel. Um, so I'd imagine that a lot of that rare earth comes off in in slag and from that point of view. Okay, but, so uh, it can be used then, but it, it's not it's not a big recovery deal in terms of. Uh, well, it just economics. it just gets lost. I think okay. I think the majority just gets lost. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stan. And now I uh, ask all the panelists to come, please, on your webcam if you have any remaining questions for any of you. You know they can raise, and and then we will wind up. Sessions. One one thing that I, I always try to push on people when they forecast about rare earths is is the idea, and I think Alex might have mentioned it indirectly, and that is every time a product gets redesigned, uh, the amount of magnet that gets used gets reduced. It's always a design goal of every generation, and so when people take uh, forecasts for say devices for wind turbines or electric vehicles, and take today's current weights or masses of those things and extrapolate, I think they always come out high. It's over, uh, always overly optimistic. And uh, and I think that's that's an issue that, that the forecasts are always a little bit inflated because of that effect. We saw it with hard drives for a long time. And I think it happens a lot of other places as well. Yeah, my name is uh, Teresa Sessa. I'm, I'm an R&D manager 
and I work for Light, it's an industrial company uh, focused on wheel recycling in Italy. So my question is for Nick, because thank you for your presentation, really interesting. I have one question for Nick is regarding the um, uh, pre-treatment process um, linked with your uh, recycling process, because you um, presented that uh, one problem, one relevant issue, is that uh, uh, it's related to the pre-treatment in terms of dismantling. So, which your, with your process, have you solved the dismantling pro process in terms also of cost? Because we discovered that uh, uh, this assembly of um, hard drift drivers is really expensive when it's a manual. Yeah, um, it is. And if we had to, if we had to dismantle manually to, to get those magnets, it would it wouldn't be cost effective. Um, the way it's become possible is is through this robotic sorting line that's been developed in a project in a previous project with the University of Birmingham, um, and that that cropping line that's able to crop the corner. Um, and, and means we can just put that corner straight into our reaction vessel. That that means that it's now, we believe it's now commercially viable. Um, yeah, if we had to dismantle them by hand every time we wanted to do it, it wouldn't be commercially viable. Um, sorry, sorry. I mean, in specifically, if you think in the future your scheme regarding hydrogen process. Uh, which is your suggestion regarding the pre-treatment process? So you you suggest a robotic uh, dismantling process uh, for hard disk drives? Yes, um, for for different things, and it's going to be. I think I suspect it will be a different a different solution for different products. So um, we're just embarking on a project now, looking at, at different kinds of speakers and loudspeakers, um, and trying to work out how to process those but the, the pre-treatment will depend a lot on on where the speakers are coming from and what the coating is that's on those speakers um, that it's all going to change the picture quite substantially um, so yeah we're a young company we're still looking for these solutions so I'm not sure I can give you a definitive answer on everything yet yeah okay Thank you for the nice answer, uh, Nick. And, and I have a couple of questions in the panel, especially for John. Uh, three related questions, you can answer them in all. So first one is, how do they deal with the thorium? How you deal with the thorium and uranium? Or are these elements part of the extraction and production plan? And how, how do you ensure ecological separation in, in China if you are you know, sending the is the concentrate to China, is there any mechanism that they are ecologically produced? And in the in the long term, uh, in line with the EU raw material alliance announced a couple of days back uh, to become independent of China, is there a long term goal within the Greenland minerals, you know, to align with the EU raw material alliance? Okay, so let me take the last one first because I could hear that one clearly. Um, yeah. The other ones I have to have repeated, I think. Um, well, uh, let me say that we're happy with the cooperation with the Shenghe. They own about 10 to 11 percent of the company, which we think is fine. Uh, and uh, we, we have no intention of doing any separation in China. The idea is actually uh, to focus, the main part of our business plan is to focus on the, the European market, and we don't foresee any products going through China. So I hope that answered the last part of the question. Could you please repeat the first one around uh, regarding uranium? I couldn't hear it. Yeah, uh, is, is the uranium and thorium content uh, is, is part of the extraction and production plan. What is the plan for the uranium and thorium? Okay, uh, we are not going to produce thorium, but uranium, we are going to produce a uranium oxide or yellow cake, as you might call it, a standardized product. Uh, what we will have to do is uh, have the, um, the Danish foreign ministry uh, enter into a nuclear cooperation agreement with the country that we're going to export this to, which will, of course, be one of the uh, countries that have assigned to the non-proliferation agreement. And uh, 
and it will go through the normal IEAA uh, standards, the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. Uh, so that's that's how we're going to do that. So we're going to produce the uranium oxide in Greenland and export it in accordance with the with the international re regulations. Or maybe you miss one of the questions: is that how you plan, or or if if you have any plan in line with the EU raw material alliance? Yeah, uh, we we want very much to be part of the. If I understand the question correctly, to be part of the the uh, European Raw Alliance uh, um, initiative. We think it's a fine initiative. That is basically why our business plan is aimed at uh, trying to to line up with with the European industry and also to to have the separation, the final separation of the rare earth um, concentrate in Europe. So, okay, that's the questions. Uh, for Nick, uh, this question, you know, what kind of feedstock, you know, are you looking in UK or in, in Europe? Is there, you know, hard disk drive or, or, or can you mix all the feedstock together for processing? Or is it wind turbine, you know, this kind of thing? What, what do you foresee? Um, yeah, we foresee a mixture. Um, um, at the moment, it's unclear exactly where we'll get it from, but, um, like I say, at the moment, we're still, we think, probably two years away from any kind of sensible production. So we're, at the moment, still in that stage of, of developing answers for different products and, and uh, processing routes for different products to get them. Uh, we, we say, uh, internally, we say reactor ready. So we've processed it to a point where we can put it in the reactor um, and we can get that hydrogen decrepitation to work um at the moment we're open to ideas i think it's the 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 scrap supply um is is um quite an immature market at the moment so you you can't go to many scrap dealers at the moment and start asking for for components containing neodymium um so yeah i think over the next couple of years we'll be talking to people and working out what we can get where we can get it from what sort of quantities whether whether that's repeatable, whether it's all got the same kind of coatings on, whether we can process it the same way, um, it's it's uh, developing fast at the moment as we start talking to people. But um, we've obviously got a solution which works with hard disk drives. Um, we're developing a solution that we hope will work with a lot of loudspeaker products, uh, and then we'll carry on developing from there. Yeah, but it's from my side, but don't you see that market would be largely, you know, uncoming shining of the wind turbines in Europe that is going to be a main source in coming years um, rather than the, yeah. the hard disk drive? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I think, yeah, there's obviously a lot of material in a wind turbine. Um, equally, it's quite a clean material, and I think a lot of recyclers would be interested in it. Um, the solution that we that we found with the hard disk drive, for example, is means that a lot of people who wouldn't be interested in it, we found a solution that works for us. Um, so yeah, the the wind turbines, I'm not sure if we'd be chasing. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to be fighting over scrap at the moment. There's so much scrap out there that's not being utilised. We need to find ways of using everything. Um, I'm not sure that the wind turbine is something that we would chase, but yes, we'd like it if we get it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Uh, any questions from the person uh, from from the audience? Any final ones? We're going to wind up soon. No, You're uh, already question. ten minutes late. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, to everyone. Uh, I have a question about like. Uh, we are using these magnets applications in Europe, and most of them are coming from China as you do. So, do you think is there a policy between the manufacturers from China and Europe so that the manufacturing and covering, as you told, like it's covered with epoxy and gum and everything, which is making the carbon content higher? And in the end, so it's harder to recycle it. So, is there some policy between China and Europe or other places where the applications are used? To reduce these things, or to use the alternates to stick the magnets to the uh, to the application. Alex, you can unmute. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So I do not know anything like this by myself. That's any possible, uh, anything like this is existing. So everybody has the complete freedom in the choice in this case. Mm, okay, so yeah. can we thank you. consider mm -hmm. this as like greenwashing because they say that, okay, these are the most sustainable, uh, if we talk about an, a TV, they say it's a sustainable TV and it uses less electricity and everything. Yeah. So for a, for a, a life of a application, they, everything should be considered even the end of life. So do you think it should be considered as greenwashing in a sense? Uh, to to what? Can you just repeat the last sentence? I'm sorry. Acoustically, I like, uh, it, uh, like uh, for example, they say TV is more sustainable because of its uh, less consumption of electricity. So they yeah. say it's sustainable, but in the end, recycling is harder because of uh, minimizing of the size of magnets and everything. So uh, can you consider this as greenwashing? Greenwashing. Yeah. Greenwashing. No, we... Like they're saying it's sustainable, but in the end, it's not. Uh, can happen. Finally, you have to look for energy consumption and so on for the whole for production, recycling, and uh, consumption and all of this. So I difficult. I cannot really answer in this case. It's okay. Too, uh, okay. Quite complex issue here. Okay. okay, thank you all for your participation and, and a final comment that you know the recording of the of the meeting and 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 the presentation slide in agreement with the with the presenters that we will be shared with all the participants. And uh, now I welcome you know Ria Treasurer Rob Koppelman to have a final word and thank and close the meeting. Rob, floor is yours. Thank you, Nabil. <clears throat> Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, first of all, I would like to thank everybody who contributed to this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, most of all, uh, the speakers of this uh, afternoon who have been uh, giving us a glance into their worlds um, that will re that were really uh, surprisingly and, and uh, telling us quite well what is going on in the world of uh, recycling. And we saw the uh, input as from mining until uh, the end of life products. I also would like to thank all the participants that have been uh, watching and have been asking questions. And I do hope that you all feel that Raya has contributed to bringing together all stakeholders in this industry in this event this afternoon. And I trust that uh, I will see you soon in our next event. And I, again, thank you all for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, and here we close and hope to see you soon.